Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 20 of Inbound Now. Today I have a very special guest. He is Mr. Brian Solis. He is a well-known and well-dressed um, online marketing thought leader. Um, he is the author of Now Is Gone and his latest book, Engage. You can see it over his shoulder there. Product placement, I like that. And um, he regularly blogs over at his site, briansolis.com. Um, and he runs his own uh, video interview series that I really enjoy. Um, it's called Revolution, and I recommend uh, people checking that out. So welcome to the show, Brian. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me on. I also want to throw a shout out to Jeff Livingston, who was the primary author of Now Is Gone. And then also, since I have the opportunity to send a shout out to Deidre Breckenridge, whom I wrote my second book with, Putting the Public Back in Public Relations. But really, uh, right now, these last uh, this last year and the next year are all about engage. Cool, cool. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, I reread it. So, so you, it came out uh, about um, I guess what a year and a half ago, and then there was a rewrite. So why the why the rewrite? Yeah, well, the book the book debuted at the last South by Southwest 2010, and it was a it's a wonderful book, and it did really well. And I was asked uh, if I wanted to make any changes before it went into its next edition and I saw well I saw an opportunity to say you know why not why not preserve the original engage its original intention and walk the walk you know and that walking the walk really entailed having spent a year listening to people's reactions uh, you know quite honestly and in all transparency you know, people loved the original book for its depth and density. I mean, it's a 400-page book. It, it explores not just social media, but social science and psychology and how we got here, uh, what we need to do as businesses to really engage not just the acts of engagement, but to genuinely build relationships through engagement. And at the same time, people didn't love it for its depth and density. They wanted... They wanted a faster, more friendly read in order to execute. Right. So I decided that there's nothing wrong with the original Engage. It's, it is what it is, and you can still read it. So if I'm going to take the opportunity to write something fresh, then let's do it. So I cut out 35,000 words, 40 topics, and added a whole bunch more stuff in there that might help people plan, execute, and measure at their pace. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and I would imagine that a lot of the stuff, you know, when you're writing a book on, you know, the social web, right, a lot of the stuff is changing every day. So was that, was that also something that you wanted to kind of update? You know, I think I changed one or two references to products in the book, but for the most part, it was written to have at least a six-year lifespan. So I didn't change anything from a timing issue because really the same principles are there. We're really looking at how do we build better foundations for engagement, uh, for relations, uh, regardless of the platforms. In fact, I could have removed Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and it probably would still be right on. Um, but that that's the point of all of this, is taking a step back. There's no shortage of books that talk about the advantages of Twitter and Facebook and all of the other emerging networks. What was really missing was a book that advised you from a business strategy standpoint and then a customer-centric approach through social science, through customer needs, advocacy, influence, etc., all of the things that we needed to learn uh, at a much deeper level in order to not talk at this, but to really lead this. Right, right. Cool, yeah. So, so one of the concepts you, know, you talk about in the book, uh, social media has kind of introduced this new, new layer, uh, new level of influencers across all industries. So how can companies uh, kind of find these influencers and, and kind of form symbiotic relationships with them? <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> all day, all day. There's a, I don't know that there's an easy answer to this. I mean, really, in all engagement starts with not just listening, but actual research. And by research, I don't mean monitoring. Don't Don't come to me and tell me how many mentions we have on Facebook and Twitter and in blogs and what the sentiment is. What I need to know is what people are saying. I need, I need to read between the lines. What are they saying about us? What are they saying about competitors? Who's saying that? Who's leading the conversations? Where are they taking place? Who's asking the most questions? Who's answering the most questions? What's recurring? Try to get some idea of this intelligence and at the same time see who the influencers are at a higher level 
looking at the marketplace in general. So that would be through tools like uh, MBlast or maybe working with you folks or maybe working uh, with a company like Tracker uh, to really identify those higher level influencers across all of those platforms and then reverse engineer. What is it going to take to move them? What is it going to take to reach the audience of an audience of an audience and in turn direct them in a way that's going to have a meaningful outcome and all of these things are things that need to be defined not marketed against right right and that's one of the things you talk about in your book you know using using those psychographics and demographics and and amongst other things um, to kind of reverse engineer how you know people's people's actions to see who they're talking with and how they think um, so so what what would be some advice uh, for for our viewers out there to kind of start building that that profile of, of the people they're trying to reach? Well, through that intelligence, we get a better idea of, of who they are. And I think the first thing we'll realize is that there isn't one place to reach them. There isn't one type of psychographic or demographic uh, or behavior graphic that we have to look at why it is that they're connecting, to whom they're connecting, and what it is that they're looking for, what's that tangible value, uh, and then building that engagement program uh, in that regard, right? So who, you know, what's the value we can deliver to each of those segments? How do we connect the dots of who those segments are and how they're connecting to one another? Two, how do we go directly? How do we go indirectly through other influential voices and intermediaries? And, and, and that could include influencers and advocates. Uh, and then how do we measure success uh, on those fronts? Because a lot of companies are rushing to Facebook and Twitter, any other social network, and they are building channels they are getting people to like them. They're getting people to follow them, but they're not really addressing the what's going to keep you connected to me. And we're already starting to see customers start to unfollow and unlike brands because there isn't necessarily value to translate the new spam in their news feed or their social stream into tangible benefits. Right, right. So, so and that's one of the things that, that you talk about, you know, stating the goals of your social media program first and then working backwards from there. So, and, and click to action, as you call it, right? So, can yeah. you talk a little bit more about that? Well, a goal can't be that we need to double our followers in 30 days. And, and, and honestly, I see that as a goal from some of the best-known brands out there. What we're really looking at is determining what's going to move the needle internally. Uh, is that sales? Is that referrals? Is that impressions? Is that... Uh, influence and behaviors that votes I don't know whatever whatever it is all, if it, is, is it all of the above uh, and then realizing that you can still have a content creation and promotion strategy you can still market you can still brand but there has to be some subset or some focus of social media directly to go and drive clicks to action that are going to have meaningful business outcomes and by clicks to action that means that there has to be an outcome a cause and effect defined in each instance if I share a tweet as an organization that I need to measure, it's going to probably include a click, a uh, click through passage. It's going to have a click path, and there's going to be some outcome out of that, so that I can measure the conversion. What happened? How many people clicked it? And what did I get out of it? So that I can constantly improve that experience. Right, right, and yeah, one of the um, I, I watched a, a talk you did um, a little bit ago at the affiliate summit, um, and you you gave an example of Walmart. Um, they they were putting out a deal. And basically, once the deal got 5,000 likes or whatever, people got the, the TV at a lower price. And, and you kind of talked about it as a new um, distribution mechanism that, that worked extremely well, extremely fast, right? So, so are these types of campaigns, do you see them as you know, being kind of like the new Super Bowl ad, like just kind of spreading everywhere virally very quickly? Or what, what, what's your take on that? Well, information does spread very fast, very quickly, and that's an advantage and it's also a disadvantage. It means that you're not just competing for the future, you're competing for the moment. And in order to compete for the future, that means that you have to consistently compete for the moment. And that's what makes social so important, but also so risky if your social strategy is anything less than trying to compete effectively for the moment. Gotcha. Walmart did that once, uh, did it very well. So what else are we going to do? How else are we going to keep people engaged? And that, I think that's really what this comes down to is that people will value engagement if there's value in the engagement. But more importantly, everyday human beings, you and me, with the connections that we're building in social networks, we are becoming mini media networks. That 
five thousand like campaign for Walmart and Facebook, you know, just just on a low estimate, if each one of those individuals are connected to one hundred and fifty people and one hundred, you know, five thousand people click that, has a tremendous reverberating effect that Walmart, you know, for the moment was on the tops of not only everybody's minds but on their news feeds and that's something we have to think about it's not a it's not a campaign driven initiative we're talking about continuum to an always on society right right yeah so so you know going through those social channels and and basically everyone liking that sharing it to all their you know if they and i i agree that is a low estimate you know 150 connections on facebook i think it's a, a lot higher actually but um so, so kind of going on that same vein, you recently interviewed um, the CEO of Adly, um, Arnie Singh, right? And uh, about celebrity tweeting and, and basically leveraging their, their influence online to spread messages. So do you see that as kind of a, a rising trend that, that's here to stay? Or is that going to become kind of uh, played out moving into the future? I, there is... There's a couple answers to this. I mean, there's tremendous value in it. And celebrities, celebrity endorsements aren't anything new. Right. Social media is a is the latest extension of of something that has worked very well over a long period of time. A lot of this also comes down to the value of the celebrity too, because social media is new for them as well. Meaning that they're able to also bypass their traditional intermediaries to reach their not just fans, but now stakeholders directly. So they have to ask themselves, what's the balance? You know, I could tweet about my favorite sunglasses, I could tweet about my favorite jeans all day long, and I can pocket some nice extra money. Uh, but what's the cost opportunity? What's the opportunity cost for that? Do I lose credibility? Do I lose loyalty? Do I lose trust? So it's also a question that they have to figure out. There's a balance. It works. People are absolutely cool with it. But to the celebrity, uh, it's going to be around for a while. It's the question is, are you going to be around for a while with a dedicated audience? Right, right. Okay, cool, cool. So, so you talk a lot um, on your blog about online influence, um, and and so so, what are your thoughts on like clout score? Do you think it's a a, a good indicator of of who to kind of reach out to, or or what what are, what are your thoughts there? I've been studying this for a very long time. I'll start by saying this. Influence is, you can't redefine it regardless of how many times social media gets to redefine other, other uh, terms. Influence is the ability to cause a change in behavior or to cause an effect. If you look at that definition and you compare it to the definition of a clout score being the standard for influence, then there's a disconnect because clout is not measuring the effect. The only way that you can measure effect is to say, I'm going to work with these cloud influencers. Their scores tell me they should be influential. So I'm going to put this outcome or this action or this measurement in the engagement campaign with them. Ultimately, that metric of engagement, what happens to the outcome, that's the real influence score. So then if you think about it that way, cloud, peer index, uh, impact, really what we're looking at uh, is an algorithm that shows almost social capital within a particular network, that there is varying uh, balances of trust and recognition and authority and expertise and popularity. And that balance ultimately comes together as a score, which usually a higher score indicates something substantial that we should pay attention to, but I don't believe that that is influence. Influence is what happens after it's activated. Right, right. So it's more of an indicator like, yeah, this person might be influential, they have a higher score, so let's kind of do our research even further to see where their audience is and, and if they're a right fit, right? Yeah, it's the capacity probably to influence. Now, where clout, the front-facing clout and the let's say if you decide to work with cloud to find influencers uh, or quote unquote influencers cloud will f the front facing cloud will show you scores the, I, the reason why I call it sort of like the private network or the, the direct engagement with cloud is because they'll work with you to find influencers around topical relevance find me all of the influencers who love to talk about Starbucks and Pete's coffee for example uh, then we start to get a little bit more specific so the capacity to influence has a a topical relevance to it. This is also what we're seeing with 
with Tracker and Peer Index, and then also MBLAST. Uh, MBLAST has a, a database that allows you to search for influencers of topical relevance and gives you a score. Now, again, all of those are giving you the capacity to influence, and in some cases, the more you drill down, the capacity to influence within a particular space. But that's for you to design, for you to activate, and for you to measure. So ultimately, the brands become the, the, the holder of who the influencers are. Okay, cool. Yeah, awesome, man. Um, so you just like blew me away there. All right, cool. So um, in the book, you mention that Facebook, as you know, you, you view it in your mind as, as the most important social network right now, and it's reaching critical mass. Um, you know, does this ring true for B two B companies? Like, would you say focus mainly on Facebook, or I mean, is LinkedIn more of a better right. option? Or again, is it where your audience is? I mean, I think you kind of you you got to the same answer I was going to give. I mean, really, and this is true. It's it's it it really is fascinating. I get this question all the time. I'll give, I'll give a, a what I'll consider a wonderful thoughtful speech that I spent a lot of time on in a room. You'll see a lot of nodding heads, and then it, invariably, or sorry, inevitably, someone in the audience is going to raise their hand and say, "But how does this apply to business to business?" And I stop and I think. The whole thing applies to business to business. Are you just now starting to listen? If you research, you're going to find the places where your prospects are, where your influencers are. That could be Facebook. That could be LinkedIn. That could be old school web 1.0 forums in Yahoo groups, for example, uh, or in, 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 in boards that are still alive and active today. Who knows? But that's why research becomes really important, and you'll find some sort of balance. And the activity within each of those communities tells you, tells you what you should think about in terms of how you're going to balance your strategy. I would also say that in business to business, there is a greater capacity for branded influence where business customers are looking for insight direction to make some very intelligent decisions and the way the business to business decision making cycle works today is they're usually dealing with approved vendors uh, or word of mouth is absolutely incredible and word of mouth is translated in the very a very traditional method but increasingly business to business organizations are looking to the other staff members within a particular division to say, what are you hearing? What do you suggest? What are you hearing out there? What are you finding out there? And those individuals are the ones that are connected through their social. They're following certain bloggers. They're reading certain experts. And much in the same way that influencers became influencers, well, your thought leaders, your experts, your, the people who are making your business what it is, can also become influential using the same channels. It's not just for intermediaries. It's, it's I think, especially for business to business. This is an opportunity to boost your cloud score. But research tells you everything, and even where to where to publish your thoughts and your expertise. Not in a newsletter, not in a contributed article to some industry publication, uh, not in an email, not into a, an eternal white paper, but as a full blown open blog post or update or video, something that your customers, your influencers can find, appreciate, and share. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, so on the, on the topic of like doing the research, how do you do it? Do you, I mean, is it, you know, you, you go through Google, do like some search queries, uh, find some influencers in the space and then ask them like, Hey, where are people interacting, you know, in your community? Like, do you, like, how do you do it? I all of the above. I don't have a template. I look at this as an opportunity to really get a a dedicated and genuine answer. So I might use Google, I might use Radiant Six, I might use Spiral Sixteen, uh I'll use Researchly published by People Browser. I'll use a, a variety of tools. I'll use Google Blog Search, okay. Technorati. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to get in like how you, how Brian Solis does his research because I mean you do dive way in depth and kind of paint a picture behind the you know what you're looking for. So, um, all right, switching gears here for a second. Um, this is kind of a selfish question. On you know you run the show uh, Revolution on on YouTube where you get a ton of heavy hitters. You've had Katie Couric, Guy Kawasaki, and Charlene Lee um, on your show. So how you know. 
How do you go about selecting guests? And what was the idea behind the show? Why did you start it? For for years, I've been sort of pushed in the direction to start a video show. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure why. I, I think a lot of it has to do with, over the years, I've had great opportunities to interview celebrities and notable personalities on stage at conferences around the world, and those individuals who've watched that or, or the interviewees themselves had suggested that you should, you should have a show. And I never wanted to be in front of the camera, so I held off uh, until it was until it was inevitable and I started the show I'm starting the show in a way that I can manage and how do I pick my guests well they have to they have to have something that's tremendous to say uh, and at the same time uh, give the audience and and me honestly something something that I can sink my teeth into to think about so that I can walk away from watching that program and go do something differently than I would have otherwise. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's uh, so, so. Do you have a studio uh, set up, or is it kind of a mobile studio? I mean, the production quality is astounding. You blow my show out of the water, but it is a show that we have engineered carefully. And I should probably preface that by saying that anything that I've tried to do, whether it's blogging, whether it's photography, whether it's podcasts, what have you. Every experiment that I've done has gone to show what happens when you invest production quality into the mix uh, and to see if it has an effect on the content. Don't necessarily have a right or wrong answer other than it is just a constant focus of mine to just experiment from that uh, standpoint. So with that said, we shoot mostly out of current studios uh, in San Francisco, current TV, and we've built our own little set and it's nice and we shoot everything on digital SLRs and we've designed it to be something that you would expect to see on a top network but for the web and also to say you know look we're not going to just do three five seven minute videos we're going to do I think Guy Kawasaki came in at 30 minutes and we're going to see if people watch it and the good news is is that we you know it has it's not a full-time production I, it could be but we, we're, we're treading lightly and cautiously. We're definitely with, with open minds uh, and open eyes. And the one thing that we have realized is that moving forward, we have to um, make it a lot more portable. So the show just went on iTunes today, uh, and we're going to continue to uh, expand its focus. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, I'm a big fan, a big fan. Um, all right, so, so one uh, final question here. Actually, I have two more. Um, so, so you talk about, um, in, in that recent talk you gave, and, and in your book, you talk about e-commerce, um, kind of e-commerce through Facebook. Um, and, and things like Blippi and American Express are kind of tying in buying um, experiences, and, and people are sharing those through their social networks. Do you see this activity actually um, Diluting the, the the value of that person's kind of Facebook stream, it's kind of. Do you see it as spam, or do you see it as something valuable to their you know community? If you trigger a like on Facebook, for example, you earn a one-time endorsement. How you keep that relationship, that like, is up to you. What we're already seeing is individuals starting to unlike brands because of that very issue. Uh, there's, a, there's a story that I'm going to be publishing pretty soon by a friend of mine who went and followed all of his favorite brands on Facebook and documented the, the results. What did his news feed look like? Uh, was he able to keep up with his friends? Was it completely s slammed with marketing messages? And there's studies out there. Uh, there was one recently by, I think, Exact Target that showed that individuals are unfollowing and unliking brands because their newsfeed is getting completely spammed. So if you're going to introduce F Commerce into the mix, don't just introduce um, your entire catalog, your entire service portfolio. Introduce certain exclusive offers or products that they couldn't get anywhere else. Uh, introduce discounts and offers and promotions. Do it in a way that gets people to feel like there's some value in that connection. 
So you use a lot of infographics on your on your blog, and and they get spread all over the web. So do you see that as a kind of a, a growing trend, and is it still working as well as it used to? Well, kind of like the question we talked uh, earlier about around video uh, and production quality. I think infographics, the market for them is is, is honestly infinite. It's just that there's a difference between great infographics and infographics just trying to get spread. It's almost like saying a viral video. There isn't a recipe for them, but great content is worth sharing. Now, with that said, that's true for blog posts, it's true for tweets, it's true for video. So how do you make great content? Not only great content, but how do you make shareable content? And I can I can tell you that there isn't an easy answer, and every infographic I, I create with the Jess 3 team, that's why we're not cranking these things out on a weekly basis. They, they take months. Uh, the, the next one that's coming out, we've been working on for, I think, about a year, uh, mostly because we don't have all the time in the world. But mm-hmm. also, it's incredible, the, the methodical process to get from the concept that you're trying to communicate to map into a very clean way to visualize it for people to say, wow, you just took a complex subject and made it so I could appreciate visually and then also share. And uh, it's been, the infographics have been wonderful. We've, In fact, there's, there was such a huge demand for them that we had to make posters out of them. <laughs> people, I, I can't even tell you how many thousands of posters people have on their walls around these infographics. Nice, nice, cool. Well, yeah, so, so Brian, where can people find you online? Uh, they can find me, uh, hopefully, at my blog at briansolis.com, at Twitter, which is uh, at Brian Solis, and on Facebook, it's uh, Facebook slash The Brian Solis. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and definitely check out his show, Revolution, on YouTube and now on iTunes. And, um, yeah, uh, get the book. I mean, I highly recommend Engage. It was a, it was a fun read. It's a, a little long, a little long. But uh, it's, it's packed full of good stuff. So I appreciate you coming on the show and hope to get you back someday. Yeah, David, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And thanks for the shout-out on the book. Yeah, no problem, no problem.